Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show, coming to you live from Sirius XM headquarters in New York City. Happy Leap Day. This is the day we're supposed to do something different, something you never do. We'll get to that. As if we really needed to add another day to this news year, the never-ending news year already. Since we last spoke and brought you the exclusive text messages in the Fannie Willis story this time yesterday, the rest of the media is playing a serious game of catch-up. Just minutes before we went to air, CNN finally updated its reporting to not only reflect that this story, its story on the texts between Ashley Merchant and Terrence Bradley, which we read to you in full yesterday, was not, quote, an exclusive, as they had posted on their website last night, hours after we had broken it, but finally added after I publicly shamed them on X for not mentioning that we had broken it, added, quote, Megyn Kelly first reported the texts Wednesday afternoon on her Sirius XM show. So I got to say, CNN... Good for you. I publicly shamed you, but it's fine. You did the right thing in the end, so I forgive you. Uh, it only took the public shaming in 14 hours, but right on, right on. It's none that we'll, we'll take what we can get. Uh, as of yet, right now, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, nothing. They did, committed the same sin, and they haven't updated their reporting. So, pfft, on you, because AJC, I've cited you repeatedly. When you break news that I could go down to the courthouse and pull the brief myself on so I don't have to cite you, I still cite you. Why do I do that? Because it's a professional courtesy in journalism. That's why I don't like you any more than you like me. I do it because it's a professional courtesy, and you need to update your reporting because I deserve the same in return. So, okay, moving on. Um, Right now, some of the biggest media outlets in America are completely ignoring the bombshells. Um, that's the New York Times, Washington Post, many others. Just, it didn't happen. It's like Terrence Bradley, they, they viewed him as a dud the other day. They don't care about the impeachment with his prior inconsistent statements with the text. They didn't care to look at the text to see how this guy completely confirmed that there was an affair before these two officers of the court testified there wasn't. All of it just remains uncovered, and you know exactly why. On top of all this... Late yesterday, the Supreme Court announced it is taking up former President Donald Trump's immunity case. Wow. Mike Davis was right. Our pal Dave did not get that one right. We'll talk to them about it when they come on later. Uh, not today, but tomorrow. Meaning Donald Trump very well may have pulled the inside straight we've been talking about. The inside straight he needs to beat these criminal cases, all four of them, or stall them until after the November election. Folks, it's happening. Uh, it caused an epic epic meltdown. You're going to be shocked when you hear who it's from. Keith Olbermann, he got upset. He's upset again. Uh, and he is labeling everyone on the Supreme Court, well, just about everyone, whores. <laughs> the whores. <laughs> Here to discuss it all in person for the first time are pals from the fifth column, Camille Foster, Michael Moynihan, and Matt Welsh. Find all of their work at wethefifth.substack.com. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. Debt. You can go to bed thinking about it and you can wake up thinking about it too. Here's the truth. The system traps you in debt. High interest credit cards and loans make it nearly impossible to pay off your debt. And insane inflation keeps you stuck paycheck to paycheck. Done with debt can be your lifeline. Done With Debt has an ingenious new strategy to help erase your debt faster and easier than you ever thought possible. Done With Debt analyzes all the debt options you qualify for. They know how to reduce bills. They know how to cut interest rates. Their skilled staff of negotiators know how to get debt out of your life permanently without bankruptcy and without a loan. Done With Debt has a bunch of experts in strategies for eliminating debt but you do need to hurry because some debt solutions are time sensitive. Here's how easy they make it. Go to donewithdebt.com. That's donewithdebt.com, donewithdebt.com. Hi guys. Howdy. Hi. Thanks so for having us. Great to see you. Great to see you. This is so in fun. Yes. yes. Look at us in director's chairs, <laughs> at the series <laughs> headquarters. Um, I, I guess we should just kick it off with Olbermann. I have so much goodness for you guys teed up. I've got oh. all your favorites. <laughs> mm -hmm. All your I favorites. I believe it. You the know Olbermann where it's yeah. and The View, too. I hope yeah. there's going to be some View. You uh, got and it. Harry? And do we have Prince Harry? We've got, and Fantastic. there's one other. Who, who else do I sometimes play? And you guys are like, him? Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a clue. He 
We once talked about how he was allegedly riding down the street. Oh, this- oh, um, oh, God, um, yeah, Chris Cuomo. Chris, Chris Cuomo. Cuomo. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's oh, coming man. out of the basement. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 the it's, yeah. it's the it's the fifth column of our stars. <laughs> so we begin with Keith Olbermann, um, who we're, we're uh, adding to our repertoire, justifiably yes. so. Take mm-hmm. a watch. Oh, no. The conservatives on the Supreme Court are Trump's whores. <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts is a Trump whore and he can burn in hell. And Justice Alito <laughs> is a Trump whore and he can burn in hell. And Justice Gorsuch is a self-contradicting Trump whore, and he can burn in hell. And Justice Kavanaugh is a drunken abuser Trump whore, and he can burn oh, in wow. hell. And Justice hell. Barrett is a handmade Trump whore, and she can burn uh, in hell. They are corrupt. Wow. They have corrupted the Supreme Court. We will have to remove them from the Supreme Court or create a replacement for the Supreme Court. Yes. Oh, oh classic. Huh. excellent. Good. It's a good plan. Yeah, I think that's, ho- that's when the whores that's, come in. He's wow. mentally ill, by the way. Yeah, there's, there's something, something wrong. wrong with him. I mean, every time I see him, I thought he disappeared. He used to have a show on television. I don't know if the people remember that, but yeah. he used to, it was the worst person in the world. Yeah. And yeah. the irony was, is it was always him. <laughs> right? always. And no one Projection. really got that. Yeah. And so, but now he's going to cancel the Supreme Court. Yeah, I, I, I can't believe that. It, is, he has a podcast? Is that true? Yes, yes. Oh. I guess they let anyone have podcasts, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> we, I, I think we should be listen, no. him, Megan. Because we have to. We yeah. listen because we have to. Yes, yeah. we, we get clips <laughs> like that gold. The whores. That's when the whores come in. I'm surprised he didn't find a way to like inappropriately fold in Katie Turr. Uh, yes. yes. He always switches. mentions. Yes. He yeah. did it again just the other day. Yeah. Yes. Do you remember we discussed the first uh-huh. meltdown about yes. her where he's yeah. like, she asked me to write her book. I used to edit her columns and her pieces. Yes. Double down with the same story last week. Yeah, it's an mm-hmm. obsession. Yeah. It was because, you know why? Because Katie Turr's sin was questioning whether the $450 million judgment against Trump was fair. Which is it that, isn't. Is it fair? She wasn't saying it's not. Yeah. Both of her panelists were like, yes, it's fair. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> because she asked the question, he resurrected, yeah. the, he, the, he is a sick man. He's a, Both yeah. former <laughs> FBI prosecutor panelists on MSNBC. Yes. That's all yes. they have. Yes. Like, <laughs> they bring a new one every day. Oh, I'm a former FBI prosecutor, and we shouldn't have the First Amendment. And by the way, Donald Trump should pay a billion dollars for Guilty. waking up. I, I do appreciate one thing about Keith Oldman is that in that clip, he said... <laughs> Usually you have, all the way back to FDR, to pack the court when you're not getting your New Deal stuff through. Pack the court. Now we've had more conversations about packing the court. He wants to now replace the court <laughs> with something else. Yeah. We don't know what that is, the but Ober I'm sure. Court. Yeah, the Ober Court. In which he says, Because <laughs> you remember in the old show, he used to call everyone sir. You sir. Yeah. And he would then denounce George W. Bush for yeah. like 20 minutes. I guess he would be, it would just be the Ober Court. Yeah. 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 Well, well, I'm glad he doesn't want to pack it. He wants to recreate it. Yeah, good luck. Good I mean, for, there is that him. pesky thing of Article 3. So yeah. I, mean, I guess somehow. <laughs> he'll deal with that, but all part of the Democrats' plan. I mean, it really is amazing that at this point, there's been no decision made apart from, we'll hear the case. Yes. We'll actually take a look at this. No, they'll swat Trump down. I mean, the question is, is it going to be 7-2 or 9-0? Yeah, he's right? going to lose. He's going to lose yeah, gonna badly. Lose. And like John Roberts is going to absolutely peacock that decision, which he will write. You can yes. pretty mm-hmm. much guess. Yes. So he will lose. It's just like, you're not going to get your trial as soon as you thought. It's the delay. But the he's right. Delay, yeah. He's won in the process of losing. The, yes. the, the delay is the win mm-hmm. yeah. if he gets elected. Yeah. <laughs> if he yeah. doesn't get elected, I mean, we haven't really talked about how that kind of ruins the inside straight. But if he gets elected, he just pulls Jack Smith off of both of these federal prosecutions and he's done. George is falling apart. New York's a joke. Both of the federal prosecutions will go away if Trump gets reelected. But Florida documents, the it's boxes. going away. He'll just pull. He'll just pull Jack Smith off of the case. That's it. He doesn't. That case is not going to go to trial before Trump gets reelected if he gets reelected. Okay. So all he has to do, he doesn't have to pardon himself. Only when there's a conviction do you have to pardon. He just says, Jack Smith, you're fired. My attorney general is probably going to be Mike Davis, very frequent guest on our show, um, is the new sheriff in town. He's going to decide whether this is an appropriate case for an independent prosecutor uh, or counsel, a special counselor. And he, the answer is going to be no. So he, both the Fed prosecutions die if Trump gets reelected. So now we're only talking about Georgia and New York. And that's why he just needs delay in the federal mm-hmm. prosecutions. And the Mar-a-Lago case, he's got it because that's just such a morass with the classified who's, who can see what. And the J6 case was the worst one. Chutkin doesn't like him. The D.C. jury won't like him. Obviously, Jack Smith doesn't like him. And that's the case he just is that she can't issue any rulings now. She can't do anything in this case until the Supreme Court issues its decision, which probably won't be the, till the end of June. And she can't even keep motion practice going, like let's keep pedal to the metal just in case. No, it has to all be shut down. 
So there's no way she's going to get this case tried when she gets, you know, the green light, which we all think she's going to get, that Trump won't win the actual argument at SCOTUS. Between July 1st and November 1st, not a chance. So that leaves Manhattan, which he would, let's say, it's the weakest case and the one most likely to be tried and maybe the one most likely he would lose. Yeah. Right? Just because the it, it would be pretty unfair and he will get zero, I think, political damage done by being declared guilty in the Manhattan case because people will see it, I think, transparently as this is just a political hit job. I mean, look at the way that Tish James is comporting herself oh, it's these incredible. days. Yeah. This is like, I mean, and this is this has something to do with the Fannie Willis too. Like, you're not bringing your best here, mm-hmm. uh, your best foot forward saying, we are uh, is serving impartial justice. We are being professional in our job. No, they're going no scoreboard yeah. and yes. you're like an elected official. Yeah. What are you doing? That's not building any confidence from people that there's any kind of sense of rule of law, a, a trusted third party is out there um, uh, delivering justice equally. So if Trump gets convicted only in Manhattan. New York has humiliated itself. New York I'm, used to be a, a shining star amongst benches and jurists. And now look what we've done in the past couple of years. We changed mm-hmm. the law so that E. Jean Carroll could get Trump and she has. Uh, this ridiculous damages award, which doesn't comport with anything of $80 million for her alleged defamation. Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, of what reputation which, again? Which almost smells like a uh, double jeopardy kind of situation. Yeah. He's being prosecuted for approximately the same thing in both of those cases, one $5 million, one $80 odd million. It was libel and then, the second that, one or whatever. Yeah, but Definitely. I mean, it's absurd. It, it bears no relation to her actual damages, this punitive award. And then we have the $450 million, 355 but with the interest, 450 so far. Yeah. Um, from Tish James, and on top of that, now you've got you've got the Stormy Daniels hush payment case coming, which I think you're right. People, maybe we're wrong, right? Maybe some portion of independents really mean no, a conviction's a conviction. It'll change my view on Trump, but over Stormy Daniels and hush money, which has been adjudicated, it, yeah. you know, six years ago, yeah. five years ago. I mean, people have made up their mind about that. In the same way that if you resurfaced the Access Hollywood tape, people wouldn't actually react to it very much. But you know, I mean, I think that the Fonnie Willis stuff. And listening to your show, and I, I said to the two lads we recorded last night, and I said, God, Megan is really obsessed with this Fonnie Willis character. Totally. <laughs> and it's so like when I and I had seen clips, <laughs> yeah. In this is, they deserve to lose these things, right? Because when I saw her um, being cross-examined, I was like, it, was there an interview process here? Because she's like, <laughs> I have bags of money. We all, don't you have a sack of money? And she's like, what the, f- is this real? This is the woman trying to take down the president? She's like, I don't use banks. My daddy never used a bank. And I was like, oh my Lord. So yeah, I think that he's doing okay now the, after I watched that. The entire case has an explicit like soap opera quality to it. It yes. feels like the sort of thing that Tyler Perry might pull together. Like this <laughs> preposterous courtroom drama, like yes. the former divorce attorney who's like incidentally just kind of acknowledges explicitly, oh, they definitely had a relationship. Yeah, I yeah. absolutely know it for sure. Yeah. And then on the stand, oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my yeah. He's like, God damn. It's, it's, like incredible. Incredible. Right? <laughs> it's incredible. It was yeah. amazing. Now, we've run the clip many times, but my favorite was she's like, you want us to believe you had hunks of cash, thousands and thousands that you just found and gave to Nathan Wade at a time when you were $4,600 under a tax lien. Mm. Oh, now you're going to tell me how to pay my bills? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, In fact, ma'am, yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love the uh, the um, uh, like very sort of shrill defenses, like oh, I, again another black woman's being attacked, yeah. um, uh, kind of thing. And w- I would suggest Which she even made herself, by the way. Sure, um, mm-hmm. so it allowed people to lean in. But for all of us in this country who laughed at Four Seasons landscaping. Right, who which laughed is funny. at some, oh, right. which is hilarious. Yeah, that brought me back. Who oh, laughed gosh. at Rudy Giuliani's Giuliani makeup, Giuliani dripping, the hair dripping down here. Yeah. Uh, who laughed at like the My Pillow guy and all these sort of weird clowns who are around Trump advising him about crazy things. All of whom are like they owe hundreds of millions of dollars Correct. in various lawsuits. Yes. By the way, um, if you laughed at all of that, or Trump's a uh, hot lawyer that both yes. of you guys like, yes. um, but <laughs> who's great lawyer? Who's Alina bad, Haba? Yes. Haba? Who's bad yeah. at lawyering from yes. everything I can, but she's I can tell. But you swipe in the right direction, Matt, when you see her profile. Wow, that's the important thing. If you laugh at all those things, and so many people in journalism laughed at all of those things, don't get high and mighty about, oh, we're being too mean to the prosecutor. Because those people that you were laughing at, those are private lawyers, turns out, right? Mm-hmm. They weren't agents of the court, necessarily. These are people who are on the payroll of the city and the state and the county and the whatever, 
they're you're paying your taxes are paying for them and they're behaving this badly. That's yeah. right. So it is funny, and we're gonna laugh because that's what you do. You laugh at all the it's ridiculousness. Laugh or cry. All right, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's twenty twenty four. That's the motto of the year. <laughs> um, then you laugh at this, but also save a little bit of outrage because you should have impartial and professional behavior mm-hmm. among the people who uh, have this awesome power that we've given prosecutors in this country, and they're not acting at all professionally or well. And by the way, on the race thing, yes, it's like white defense attorneys representing, I I don't know if they're all white or black, I actually haven't looked at the defendants in the Georgia case, but the two witnesses against Fannie and Nathan are also Mm -hmm. black. Mm -hmm. It's like they're doing their best to make it into a black thing. It's failing. I will tell you, we have an interesting update today. We talked yesterday, let me pull it up on my phone, um, about Terrence Bradley, the difference between Terrence Bradley, you know, in the text to Ashley Merchant, like, yeah, they totally started well before they testified, and I can give you all these names, and I, these are the people who I think know, um, versus on the stand, I know nothing. I, it was, you know, S- speculation. Sergeant <laughs> Schultz, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, I, nothing. I don't know enough you to know if I was lying. lying. I have the old, like I'm an ancient person, honestly. All my references are so old. Yeah. Somebody once said on Twitter the other day, you're old if you like Frasier. I'm like, yeah. huh. Oh, no. Well, Frasier. on the podcast last night talking to this very issue, I did make a Red Fox reference, so uh, go yeah. ahead works with for Tom. Me. Yes. Tom Who didn't watch it? Um, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the guy who spoke to Terrence Bradley in between cooperative Terrence Bradley and I Know Nothing Terrence Bradley was, um, his name is Banks. Okay, I'm trying to remember his first name. Is it Gabe? Yeah, Gabe Banks. And this, we told, told the audience yesterday that Gabe Banks called, according to Terrence Bradley, Terrence Bradley, after it became pretty clear he was cooperating with the defense in some way, or at least there was a suspicion. And suddenly, Terrence Bradley did a 180. You know, mm-hmm, no, nothing happened. And so the implication by the defense lawyers at the te- hearing was, he threatened you, right? Like, we don't know what he threatened you with. There's a whole host of things, potentially. Um, I don't know, it could be anything, but Gabe, this guy, Gabe, is very close friends with Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade. We knew he was friends with Nathan Wade, and we knew that his wife worked for Fannie Willis. Well, now it turns out, um, let me get the, the facts correct. He, Banks, was sworn in as a judge, pro tem, under Fannie Willis um, in a different court. And not only that, he also invited Fannie Willis to his wedding. And we've seen pictures of Fannie Willis all around his wedding. So Fannie Willis, it's not just Nathan Wade. Fannie Willis is very close, apparently, with this guy Banks, who was the one person, according to Terrence Bradley, who did call him in between cooperative Terrence Mm. and Sergeant Schultz Terrence. Mm. Doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. No. So what's the upshot here? She's removed from the case. There's questions about kind of the credibility of things. They've got to find a new attorney to end up leading the case. But it doesn't necessarily mean the case goes away. No, it doesn't. But it it certainly could mean that it's delayed until after the election. Correct. And that, now he would not, as president, have the power to pull that DA off of the case. But the the thing is, there are real questions about, this is Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's not New York, you know? The real question about whether there's another DA down there who wants to take this case. Yeah. Can you, Matt, why would you want to take this on? You'd have to be somebody who's very politically ambitious, Mm -hmm. who wanted to make herself a star, which we know is true of Fannie Willis. She hired the media company to monitor her mentions, get back to me with how many articles they're writing about me. She runs to the microphones every time she gets the chance from the church to beyond. And now any prosecutor knows what he or she's getting themselves into. You've got a very talented team of defense lawyers on a very shitty case. This is a crappy made up RICO violation that she just found a way to bring. So who would want this dog and to have to make it hunt and sick the new president or likely president against you? Like, I don't know that that it is clear in a state Mm -hmm. like Georgia, there's another DA at the ready. And I actually don't even know, I think, um, the way they'd have to do it is there's like an overseeing board that would like decide Mm -hmm. or try to get a prosecutor to take it. And I think that board, it's not a bunch of Fulton County uh, Democrats. It's more statewide, which means they're probably a little redder. Impartial. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. So it's the best Trump could hope for. Mm -hmm. I just think that you should never count out Americans right now uh, ability to 
uh, voluntarily uh, self degrade um, uh, as they're going about their like poli that. uh, political that's a, that's a lives. Hopeful I mean, thought. Uh, how many times? Uh, I need to see this with Trump and his legal team and his personal conduct and other things. Like you think he's not going to do the next thing, is he? Like it's been seven, eight years that he's been in our political life. He does the next thing oh, yeah. every time. <laughs> every time. And the people, um, the Never Trump uh, crew, they do the next thing too. Yeah. Um, or mm -hmm. they will they will come back and relitigate and say no, like he's a, he's still still is a Russian stooge. They're, they're still yeah, holding I mean, on to this. We, we're at the point where if you go back, and I actually had cause to do this for something I was writing, went back to look at MSNBC and Rachel Maddow in particular in 2016, 17, 18, and it is uh, just a derangement. It, it, watching it with the kind of eyes of right now, after the Mueller report, after everything we know about Russia, mm -hmm. that Donald Trump was an agent of the Kremlin, of the KGB, of the FSB, of the Bolsheviks of 1917. Anything they could throw at right. him yeah, was right. unbelievable. So they tried to do this in, in every possible way. And you get it from, you know, the, the, the Access Hollywood tape, which I mentioned before, you know, all of this stuff. The guy's a bad guy. OK, well, the people who like him, well, they're deplorables. They're mostly racist. OK, that number is very, very big, 60 plus million. So where do we go? We can't call them all racist. That just doesn't really read with most people. And then the lawfare started. And the lawfare is like, does Donald Trump set himself up for this? Yes, he does. Every time. Because he cannot help himself. He walks into these issues. The call, let's not forget, in Georgia is a pretty despicable call that if you had Joe Biden ever saying something like that, all of my conservative Republican friends would be like, can you believe that Joe Biden was admonishing these uh, officials saying, go and find me the votes? <laughs> it's a bad sentence, right? It's not a perfect it's call. It's not a bad sentence. I mean, I mean, it is a bad sentence, but I can defend the nature of the call. You can defend yes, the nature okay. of the call, sure. and it might not be illegal, and it's the, the RICO stuff and all this stuff seems, seems insane to me, but it's let's just say it's a bad look. Yeah. And the very, very, like, he sets Agreed. himself up mm -hmm. for this And stuff. his behavior after January 6th, and after the yeah, election, it was terrible. It terrible. Yeah. And terrible. It, and it remains terrible um, uh, for a lot of reasons. But I, this desperation, they don't want to win fair. They don't want to fight it out at oh, the I, ballot box. I have got to That's play it. the Chris Hayes soundbite now. I mean, you just oh, teed no. it up perfectly. Watch his reaction to finding out that SCOTUS is taking this in April, the yeah. immunity case. He, yeah. I mean, talk about meltdown. Look at it. all the things you just said. Watch. That they would rob the People's Department of Justice the opportunity present all the evidence of his guilt. That the voters of this country, uh -oh. Uh -oh. you and I, the hundreds of millions of us, might be robbed of the information we need to determine whether the man is guilty of the gravest crime any politician has been accused of since the Civil War. If you were hoping that Donald Trump's authoritarian disregard for the rule of law was going to be stopped by Americans' institutions and the court at the highest level, that hope is severely diminished today. The Mueller investigation didn't stop him. Two congressional impeachments did not stop him. Today is the starkest proof yet that in the zero-sum battle between MAGA and democracy, there was and is only one thing that could ever truly stop Donald Trump, and that is we the people. Americans voting against him, a majority. The light yeah. bulb has finally <laughs> gone off. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and when you're hungry, you eat. I mean, there are other basic things that you want to talk about. I mean, I, you know, I've done Chris's show a number of times. I like Chris. He's a very, very smart guy. But that is a distilled cope. That is very, <laughs> mm. very hundred proof cope of saying we didn't get him and listing off these things. Oh, you're trying to get him. I think mm -hmm. you're trying to illuminate things for the voters. Yeah. You just said two contradictory things, or maybe they're complementary things, that we, um, the people, need the information. Oh, and by the way, why didn't we get him this time? Now, oh God, we have to do it at the ballot box. And, and yeah, that yeah, the Supreme sure. Court has robbed the Justice Department mm -hmm. of its opportunity to hold him to account. What? Yeah. The, they're kind of the head of the Justice Department, of all justice uh -huh. in the United right. States. Mm -hmm. yes. And they ultimately will tell us what the law is or is not, the Constitution is or is. Like, he's upset that they're playing any role in it whatsoever. It's the Supreme Court. Don't you want, if you are a critic of Trump yeah. and of uh, crazy ideas about presidential immunity or executive branch or executive authority mm -hmm. immunity, don't you want the Supreme Court to come out 7-2, maybe even 9-0, saying, no, you can't claim immunity for the bad guy doing bad things while he's in office. That's not enough. That's why uh, they're doing it. That's why mm -hmm. they're doing it. They're and they're going, going to, they're going to rule against him. When they, when they come up with that rule against him, it's going to 
uh, weaken his cases in court. It's going to remove a tool from him, and it's going to build something that our kids and our kids' kids are going to be able to, if we still have a country, uh, are still going <laughs> to, I hear that we're, we don't have a country yeah, anymore because <laughs> of because fentanyl on the border or something, but, um, uh, but uh we want those tools. We want the Supreme Court to have that ruling. That's a good ruling. And that's a good ruling from an MSNBC point of view, and it's a good ruling for the Fox point of if view. If they really just wanted to be partisan hacks, the Supreme Court, they would not have fast-tracked the appeal. They didn't have to take it for this term. They could have said, you got a very good appeal here, sir. We'll, we'll hear it when we come back mm. for business in October, which completely would have you know, basically kept them out of it and allowed the lower case to potentially go. But they, this is what Jack Smith said. He mm-hmm. said, don't hear it, but if you're going to hear it, because Trump hadn't actually sought an appeal, he had sought a delay. And the Supreme Court said, we're gonna treat this as a petition like to actually appeal, and we're gonna treat it, and we're gonna go forward with an appeal right now. So Jack Smith got a little win, and Trump got a little win, and the Supreme Court's ultimately, we all agree, gonna give Jack Smith a bigger win, but net-net, it's a win for Trump because of delay. All right, I wanna raise one other thing with you guys, because you mentioned um, the revisionism and looking back and uh, the hackery. Couple weeks ago, when the news broke about Smirnov, the FBI informant, Mm -hmm, being mm -hmm. full of shit, Mm -hmm. right? That this guy was misleading the um, FBI and then ultimately all of us about Biden and Biden Jr., Hunter, taking the five million and five million bribes. Um, We literally had a segment on MSNBC where their, I think it was the national security reporter said, this totally redeems those 51 intelligence agents. Correct. Who said- I saw that, yeah. Did you see? It's Russian. It was absolutely astonishing. It yeah. was crazy yeah. talk. Maybe yeah. we can pull it over. Team, I didn't ask for it. See if you can find it because we had it cut at one point. Yeah. But that that's the level of madness that we're at right now. It's actually, mm-hmm. I don't even think it's madness. I think it's sinister because you know, if you're somebody who's a national security correspondent, that all of the information about Hunter Biden, it remains true in the sense that he had a job that he was totally unqualified for. Mm-hmm. He was a drug addict. He was getting paid an exorbitant amount of money. For what reason? for his last name, yeah. period, right? He did say in text messages, you know, my dad's gonna be pissed <laughs> if this doesn't have the big guy. Sure did. All this, you know, he's having dinners with people there. What does that mean? Okay, well, we can go into the weeds on that, but it doesn't invalidate any of those claims and things that should be looked at. The fact that the president's brother and the president's son are involved in these shady business dealings, they are relevant. And are there things that should be pulled back from that? I think so, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. we have to look at this stuff again. I mean, the, the FBI is in association with a guy because he has associations with Russian intelligence. Mm-hmm. That's why they're in business with yeah. him. They're aware of this stuff. Is there stuff that he, la- apparently there is. I don't know, we have, we'll, we'll find out. But to say that this invalidates everything. Well, the, all those, and and the, what, the, what he's saying is, again, we're gonna try to find the clip, but what he's saying is that that letter by those 51 intelligence agents saying that the Hunter Biden laptop was, 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 dis- was fake, yeah. Russian was disinformation, yes, that they've been redeemed, no. mm-hmm. yes. that somehow this this one guy with Russian yes. connections, which they knew he had Russian connections, to your point, yeah. that that somehow makes them right in retrospect. It's a lie. That's not, the Hunter Biden is suing right now saying the laptop is mine and it shouldn't have been disseminated <laughs> yeah. to anybody other than before. me. Yeah. He, it is his, and, and he's should, acknowledged it. And I should say this, that I mistakenly presume that everyone would know that that letter was about the laptop. The incredible thing was that you could have validated in one day. It was mm-hmm. a very, very simple thing. Everyone was lying about it at the time. You just find one of the emails and t- call the person who's on the other end of that email and say, did you get this email? Is this a real email? The yeah. people aren't inventing those chains. Mm-hmm. Very, very easy and very, very quick to do. The idea that, the, that all of this was misinformation uh, or that this has been vindicated, I think is an unbelievably sinister way of presenting information. It's false. It's fake. The, the the laptop was real. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the thing that's key As about their own this, network is verified. They've they all verified, verified it, yes. it now. And the key to this is what happens when you say Russian, Russian agent, he was talking to the entire, it's like putting oxygen into the fire. It reignites mm-hmm. for all of them. And they're like, the Russia thing is I'm back. back. And we can talk about Russia again. And it's like, well, yeah, but you're not talking about it in a way that's even remotely honest. Yeah, it's no, it's the moment dishonest. at the massage when, yeah. you know, you flip over and you know what well, happens. I, I, <laughs> yeah. 
I've oh, never done anything too? like that. I don't that. go to your <laughs> massage parlor, Megan. Maybe, maybe I should. Yeah. Great the people. I love them. The yeah. conclusions in all of these instances always precede the evidence. Like they know that Trump is bad. They know he's a criminal of various sorts. Whatever the merits or demerits of these cases, not up for debate. The only question here is whether or not people are going to scrutinize these yeah. prosecutions, whether or not they're going to indulge any of the delay tactics or whatever else that the Trump, the Trump defense team employs to try to fight back against these cases. You may or may not like those things, but I would expect an honest journalist who is trying to look at this in a somewhat objective way to acknowledge some of these cases just aren't particularly great. Yeah. Some of these cases do appear to be explicitly politically motivated. I mean, if you're someone who supported the inquiry into uh, President Trump's, then President Trump's call to Ukraine, and yeah. thought this is justifiable. We should ask questions about that. Sure. I don't see how you're not in favor of an inquiry into Joe Biden and his son's conduct, especially because his son has said repeatedly in private correspondence, yeah, my dad is involved. Uh, my all dad they're is looking to do is there cover their own heights. We were together. right all along. We were right about Russia. Right. We were right about the 51 intelligence agents. Here is the clip we found. It's from Morning Joe, and you'll see and listen to um, Willie Geist and Ken Delanian. Watch this nonsense. The revelation of a Russian-linked informant here comes nearly four years after many in the American intelligence community warned Moscow was behind many of the allegations being levied at the Biden family. Willie, those 51 uh, former intelligence officials, they paid a steep price for signing that letter. And as it turns out, <laughs> they were Russian? right. Oh Not in the sense, they said that the laptop was part of a Russian information <laughs> operation or had all the hallmarks of a Russian information operation. They didn't say that the contents of the laptop were made up. And obviously we know that they weren't. Many mm -hmm. of them have been now corroborated. What they said was they were suspicious about why that story was emerging in the middle of an election campaign. And now what? they've been proven correct in the sense that no, we now what? know that Russian intelligence, at least according to the, uh, the statements of this informant, bolstered somewhat by this indictment, were feeding him information, false information. But yeah. back to those, those 51 intelligence officials, I mean, obviously yeah. what they were doing was trying to help Joe Biden. They've acknowledged that. But the point that they were making in that letter <laughs> holds up over time, which is that the Russians no. were trying to fly the story it doesn't uh, that hold Joe up. Biden and what his son were about? corrupt. Sorry, Isn't that's that crazy. outrageous? Yeah. I've been saving that for you guys. That is crazy. That's so like, the, ar the argument is basically, yeah, sure, it's all true, but these guys gave it to them and that was bad. I think that's what he's saying. I'm trying to in the middle the of the decoder ring. The, the Russians have been out to, to get us. Yes. Th that's it. And that's and so really all those 51 true, agents were But why wouldn't they concoct emails and give more persuasive evidence but what, so that, what I think is actually, evidence. I think this is probably what happened. And again, you know, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of America, I want you to know that I'm speculating here, just like I was on the stand at a Fonnie Willis Trump, <laughs> just, just speculating. But I imagine that there was a Russian guy, just random person, who smoked a ton of crack with oh. Hunter Biden, yeah. which I've heard is actually a very fun time, and then was like, let's go to the laptop shop in Delaware and just drop it off. Yeah. You'll, you'll probably forget about it. And they're like, you know, to the other Russian. And then hit the water slides. It's not as if this stuff was hacked material material in like the WikiLeaks way. Right. Because then you maybe would have a case. Yeah. Okay, this stuff is real, but where did it come from? A dubious source, we get rid of that idea and say, well, it's a dubious source, but it's true, and the contents are true. The the idea that this was a Russian setup is the fact that Hunter dropped the laptop off himself. So the mm -hmm. legally blind guy. Yes. <laughs> Who then yes. got contacted by Rudy Giuliani, or who then contacted Rudy Giuliani, but Hunter do. never, <laughs> his <laughs> Hunter never paid him. Mm -hmm. to yes. say, my God, there's some crazy shit on here. You yes. should take a look. Yeah. The Russians had nothing to do with it. No. That's the truth. The 51 intelligence agents ha had, they were completely wrong to suggest, yeah. right, in advance of that presidential debate, that this was Russian disinformation planted and so on. And by the way, Hunter Biden fostered that lie. Joe Biden fostered that lie. Mm -hmm. All of them, and it was a lie. And, and the fact that there's this one agent with ties to Russian intelligence who we knew had those ties, that's why we were using him as an agent, wound up making one thing up about Hunter having nothing to do with a laptop does not rehabilitate any of those guys. No. Mm -hmm. I think one unstated reason why people are so invested in that story being true that is not true is that, and this kind of goes to the whole um, role that the laptop story played, is that the media and social media included treated the Hunter Biden laptop uh, story and the New York Post story back then 
um, with this sense of PTSD from Hillary Clinton and James Comey mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. October of 2016. Correct. Um, there's this, yeah. there's this uh, media self-analysis, which I think is incorrect, but it's at least interesting um, that they, you know, they overplayed the Hillary Clinton email server so much then, right. um, and it we're not going to that cost the election, and we're not going to do that again. It's a very strange thing for someone who's supposed to be in kind of a semi-impartial fact-gathering business to like uh, judge their actions based on the potential electoral impact. When I was uh, get, growing up in journalism, that wasn't the way that people de- tend to think out loud, at least. But um, a lot of the people who want to rehabilitate those 51 intelligence officers who were lying um, and are trying to rehabilitate their own decisions yes. in mm-hmm. supporting Twitter for banning the New York Correct. Post yes. from Twitter. Yes. Not yep. just like the story, just banned the, the newspaper. Story, and then they banned the, the New York Post. In that story, the Hunter Biden laptop for me, you know, as a journalist, and of course, one of the things you have to point out in this is journalism always overemphasizing its degree of importance. Mm -hmm. That had we not done that, no. Like the people who were voting for Donald Trump in swing states were like, you know, I was just looking at this New York Times story about Hillary Clinton. (laughs) That that didn't happen, guys. I'm sorry, nobody gives a shit about what you think. Stop thinking that you matter. They don't matter. But the thing that, why the Hunter Biden laptop uh, story was so important for me was literally watching the media collapse in a way that was like, no, no, we have control of everything. Mm. We control the narrative. And Mm -hmm. they've done that in a quiet way, not so Mm -hmm. quiet all the time, but it's given people like Brent Bozell and these conservative groups saying, there's a liberal media, that's what it used to be. When that started spinning out of control, when there was other avenues of people getting news, whether it's Megyn Kelly's podcast or the fifth column or whatever it might be, you know, Glenn Greenwald, you know, who's talked a lot about this story and I think he left The Intercept, a company he started over this story because they're saying, like you look we no longer have all the keys so we we need to actually just shut stories down now and that's what they did they shut a story down preemptively and saying like well we don't know if this is true we don't know if it's Russian different disinformation. It's like, you can say that about how many stories? You write anything. Pretty much anything. Not only that, but I mean, it's not just that they were being skeptical and agnostic. Yeah. They were saying that it positively was disinformation mm-hmm. when it positively was not. They came to the conclusion that was the opposite of the truth. Wait, did, did, Twitter at the time didn't say that though, right? They didn't explicitly say that. They right. didn't, they didn't need to. They didn't need to. Two points. One, Cheryl Atkinson, you know, she left CBS after many, a dozen yeah. years or so. And and she's actually got a podcast out right now talking about how over there she was having a similar problem. It's why she left. It was all of her stories kept getting killed, she believed, for either ideological reasons or because they were in bed with the subject of her reporting, right? Mm-hmm. Like these media companies have been so bought up. It used to be that the principle of reporting the news, irrespective of who might be paying your advertising bills, was more important, right? But now who's paying your advertising bills is more important. That's, you know, after the drug partnership and Pfizer's everywhere, that was one of the issues she was talking about. This report she tried to do on Boeing and the explosions of these lithium batteries on board Boeings. And she had gotten a whistleblower who was ready to go out with this whole report and they kept killing it at every turn. But anyway, the censorship happens in a number of different ways. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a very different model than it was when we were all kids watching it's the nightly news. Now. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's explicit now. It's explicit. And the second point is Hunter Biden is back in the news, as you may have seen. Mm-hmm. It was on Capitol Hill yesterday. Um, this is per Andy McCarthy, who put this together at National Review yesterday. I am here to provide the committee's with the one uncontestable fact that should end the false premise of this inquiry. I did not involve my father in my business. <laughs> Cut back to his WhatsApp message, July 30th, 2017, sent to his CEFC, Chinese Communist Party, uh, business partner official. I am sitting here with my father, <laughs> and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. Mm. Tell the director I would like to resolve this now before it gets out of hand, and now means tonight. And Z, <laughs> if I get a call or a text from anyone other involved in this other than you, Zhang or the chairman, I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me and every person he knows and my ability to forever hold a grudge that you will regret oh, not following wow. my direction, I am sitting here waiting for the call with my father. Yes, I mean, with my father. And did you see his explanation for this? He was, yeah. he was inebriated, he which that was is a high. very the, 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 the,
<laughs> super duper high I and can't remember anything. I don't know what. It, maybe I was drunk or high when I sent that. I've never written a text email. that was that no. you know perfect. When I was, it's usually <laughs> yes. like I cannot Did believe you how awesome this movie is. It's usually <laughs> something is really bad. It's, this yeah. ice cream tastes but so it's good. A, imagine <laughs> you're in a situation. This is the situation. Where, where are in, the Cheetos um, with the the president and his family? That the two best arguments against, you know, you being a guilty party and any of this stuff, is that you're a crackhead or you have dementia. <laughs> <laughs> Those are our two options, America. It's like, I'm sorry, I was Truth screwed hurts. up on crack, I mean, and my dad, you know him, he's like falling down upstairs <laughs> yeah. all the time, so what are you going to make of it? So this story reminds me of my, my husband's sister, and she's hilarious, she lives in Cape Cod, and um, she he launched a podcast, it, it airs on Sirius XM, it's called Dedicated with Doug Brunt, and she always does the voice test texting, which is not good. No, no, it does not no, translate not, not the words yeah, properly. Yeah. And so her texts are always hilarious because you're like, well, what is she saying? And what she had meant to say was, Duggar, I just really love your podcast. Oh, no. And the way it translated was, Duggar, I really love your black ass. <laughs> 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 Not mutually exclusive, yeah. I suppose. I was really worried about the word Duggar. Yeah, me too. That could have yeah, played was, different. That was... Wait, wait, why? My mind's not going there. Uh, yeah. There's a couple versions of that. Oh. <laughs> Fucker? Is that what? The, the, <laughs> a lot of possibilities. Camille might be. Camille, the, Camille's the one who's always either. coming up with that. I don't, yeah. I don't know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right, stand by. <laughs> We're gonna let that marinate while we take a quick break and squeeze in some lucky advertiser who gets to come after that. <laughs> More with the fifth column right after this. Do you owe back taxes? Pandemic relief is now over. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. That's scary. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved over $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they can help you secure the best deal possible, too. Whether you owe 10 grand or 10 million, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay or you're on a fixed income, they can help finally resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call 1-800-245-6000 for a private free consultation or visit tnusa.com slash Megan, tnusa.com slash Megan. We're live in person at SiriusXM headquarters. It's funny because my uh, hairstylist, Sarah, and friend is with me because, you know, we need good hair. And she asked me whether I have PTSD working here right across from Fox. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the truth is I have it more from NBC, which yeah. is right across, yeah, the right across the street. Yeah, yeah. I don't have PTSD from my Fox years, though, you know, it's a mixed bag, right? You kind of look at the building and it's like some, some good memories, but a lot of tough ones, too. I'm so much happier being where I am now. It's like, aren't you guys so happy to be independent? Aren't yes. you so happy now with Vice imploding? What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know anything guys. about this uh, <laughs> media organization that was horrible. Um, no, I mean, I, I have to say that um, the German word uh, schadenfreude is absolutely perfect for this because yeah. you see it happen and you still have a few friends there. But at the same time, you also say, I've been telling you this was going to happen for a very long time. And it's not, as everyone says, because executives made too much money. They did make too much money. They were terrible. They were really bad at everything. But um, no one talks about the most important thing, which was content. And the content became insufferable and priggish mm -hmm. and scolding. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to come home from a day of work, sit down on the couch, turn on the TV, open up their laptop, and be told that you know the, their privilege is uh, mm -hmm. destroying everyone around them. How did they go like woke with this guy as their founder? By the way, I heard an interesting report on the journal um, that he was offered 3.5... 3.6. Three point six billion dollars <laughs> by Disney at one point to sell Correct. Vice. Yes. Now it's completely it's out of business. Mm -hmm. The latest that the, the investment firm bought it for was three hundred and fifty million, but yeah. it's not worth that anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's closing. I mean, it's done. The experiment's over. It's and it used to be this kind of hip, cool place for like, especially young guys. I don't know. It yeah. seemed like young guys would would read yeah, Vice I mean, and that's watch what Vice. I went to work there for that reason, and the fact that that deal uh, didn't go through did make me financially a lot poorer, <laughs> been a yeah. lot richer. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who are in the same situation that they held out. And when you start believing your own bullshit, it's a pretty 
um, like a legitimately toxic environment, not in the, the sort of trendy use of that word, but people start believing the media narrative about themselves. Mm. Um, What's the name? Is it Shane Smith? Shane Smith, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, but, you know, it's funny that when you look at all these old stories, the 3.6 billion dollars was at the same time that the valuation of the company was five, and sometimes even six billion dollars. Mm -hmm. It's a privately held company. How do all of these media organizations report that stuff without a caveat? The caveat is we're trusting the people mm. from within this company mm -hmm. who obviously have an incentive to inflate the value of the company. The reason that number was considerably lower from Disney was because they got to take a few peeks inside. And I think that was even a little much, which is why they walked away and didn't fight for something in the middle or something. Mm -hmm. That the, the collapse of that essentially spelled the end of the company. So how did they go? How did they go woke and annoying? I sat next to that guy years ago, was maybe, maybe sixteen, I think it was. Mm -hmm. We went out to the Oscars. This is mm -hmm. back when you know people wanted to be uh, next to me at the Oscars events because they thought I hated Trump. Yeah. And then they found out I didn't, and it went downhill. <laughs> yeah. um, but we went to this event, and I remember we were sitting at this table with yeah. like Rupert Murdoch and Lachlan. Murdoch. Murdoch mm -hmm. and Shane Smith, mm -hmm. and he was like this cowboy, you know, mm -hmm. it was like saying mm -hmm. really loud, mm -hmm. foul things, which I wasn't offended by, but I was like, wow, look at it. It's yeah. very different than the other table mates. Um, and that was, they were interested in him, I think, for the same reason every yeah. media mogul was interested in him because he seemed young and like a, yeah. like a gunslinger. And they were scared of the future because their core audience averages age 70. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So yeah. what yeah. happened? How does that guy wind up, you know, with a woke organization? Was it because he cashed out a couple years ago? Uh, well, I, I remember being in the office, uh, an older iteration of the office, when someone whispered to me, I guess it was 2011 or 12, that Rupert Murdoch was there. And everyone was like, wait, Rupert Murdoch is here? Why? Mm -hmm. And then we find out why. He put money into the, to the, to the organization. Other people in his family did too. I think that there's a number of reasons that it fell apart. There's a number of reasons that the politics became so crazy. But I think the most obvious one is when you give up control because you want to be taken seriously. When you're the cowboy mm. organization, you want the accolades of the real people. You want the awards from the actual institutions. And then you start hiring people from journalism school and they ruin it. They ruin mm -hmm. it. I don't think it was Shane Smith that made a decision to, I, I think people sat back and said, well, these are what the pros do. They know what's, what's, what's right. And it turns out that nobody liked this stuff. The other stuff, I mean, if you, I, I never used comments as a weather fan of anything, no, particularly on like YouTube comments. But if you looked for the past like three, four or five years on the comments on, on Vice stuff, the first 20 were always, what happened to you guys? I mm -hmm. used to love this stuff and now I can't stand it. And you know, I, I'm not, you said Cheryl Atkinson, I'm not unlike that in the sense that yeah, I couldn't do the stories I wanted to do. I stopped even bothering to pitch them at a certain point. That's what she said, too. And tried to make the stories that I did do better and, you know, more balanced and more interesting. And I hope I did a good job at that. Um, but, you know, it's my fault, too. I stayed there. I mean, I was well compensated. And, you know, we had a show on HBO and it was great to do that. But um, it involved a certain amount of compromise. And huh. no one came to me saying, you know, you have a slightly different point of view. That'll be more fun for the show. That'll create a little tension. People will get involved. They'll debate it. They'll argue about it in the comments, whatever it might be. There is a point where nobody wanted that. You know, if you went into a, a meeting, an editorial meeting, and you pitched something that was any of the stories that, you, that I've ever talked about in the show, it would just be silence. And, you know, people, people would not want to do any stories that were off the kind of acceptable path of you know, what, what can one say? Progressivism. That's probably mm -hmm. the easiest way. To say How it. much did the New York Times story or series, I forget what it was, that came out, I think 2019, um, portraying Vice as like this yeah. toxic hotbed yeah. of, of uh, like, you know, quasi-rapist misogyny. Right, misogyny. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 2019. Uh, yeah. yeah, I forget exactly when it was. But like that, and that story was long gestating. Everyone was like stealing for it for months. And then they dropped it on a Saturday. They dropped it on a Saturday. It wasn't What very, happens when you drop a story on a Saturday? It Go wasn't a very bye. convincing yeah. story, but, um, but I'm sure it had internal ramifications of advice. Some people left uh, because of it. How much did that moment... But I, you know, the funny thing about stories like this is... A lot of people breathed a sigh of relief and they said, well, you know, it wasn't that bad, this New York Times story about a Me Too scandal or a series of small ones within Vice. And, you know, I made a different argument and said, yeah, but you know what people are going to remember? That there was a story. 
That's all they remember. Mm-hmm. They don't remember any of the details. Mm-hmm. Nobody remembers That's any true. details. They do remember, I mean, the big ones in like in your situation, like Roger Ailes, that w- and they were trying to get, you know, Shane Smith. They were trying to get the top leadership. They didn't get that. Um, and they got a lesser story. But it, that was the beginning of the end for the organization. They cleaned house after that. They brought in a bunch of, you know, boring corporate people. They made sure that the CEO was a woman, of course. And people who had no idea what the brand and what the idea was, And I talked to people who told me one thing about politics, about how they viewed the world, and then would get on a call or do a town hall with the entire staff and say something entirely different. This happened over and over and over over Yeah, did you have to pull a pink Starburst starburst out of a jar (laughs) and tell your sandwich story? My versions of that are a thousand times better. (laughs) And they're more numerous. Yeah, there's There's still There's still truthers, chicken truthers, who are (laughs) saying it's made up. Nicole Hannah-Jones is still at it, going out there saying, go ahead, was this fact-checked? Was this fact-checked to the point where the Atlantic had to come out and say, yes, we fact-checked even the Chick-fil-A story. And this is the Adam Rubenstein story. Yeah, the guy who left New York Times and said, the, I, I got the, shamed over the fact that I said I like Chick-fil-A. Yeah, I mean, and, he uh, left over the, the, the James uh, Tom Bennett Cotton thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. email. But it was funny. It, like, they didn't even come out and say it. It was uh, Jesse Single, our friend and the host of, one of the hosts of Blockchain Reported, who emailed them. Because everyone's <laughs> truthering on X. And Hold just, that thought. You, I actually, emails. I do want to pick this up because you've got to hear some of this. Uh, yeah. But i got to pay a bill first. I love to pay my bills because my advertisers make these conversations possible. Stand by. Fifth Column stays with us. Financial experts thought we were in the clear. They were anticipating around six rate cuts by the Fed this year. And then the inflation data came out higher than expected. This is not going away anytime soon. How could it? The U.S. is $34 trillion in the hole. And yet we keep printing money, which just pushes the prices you pay every day even higher. You know that. So you can either bury your head in the sand or you can do something about it. One option to consider is diversifying a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold can be your hedge against inflation, and Birch Gold makes it easy to own. They will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and you don't pay a penny out of your pocket. This is an A-plus rated business by the Better Business Bureau. Text MEGAN to 989898 and get your free info kit on gold. Then talk to a precious metals specialist about how you can choose to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, to 989898 now. All right, we can't leave the subject of Vice News without asking you about this this made news. Um, Per CNN, see, that's how you do it, Um, media reporter (laughs) Oliver Darcy, he, in his newsletter, he talked about this virtual vice media town hall it happened on Wednesday. The meeting had to, quote, be ultimately scrapped after some laid off employees invited to the virtual meeting inundated leadership with thumbs down <laughs> emojis. Yeah. Yeah, it's they, funny. quote, it's became funny. too much to ignore, flooding the screen for all to see, said a vice media executive. In a statement to CNN, the spokesperson said, it's unfortunate that employees remaining with the organization who greatly want to contribute to its success were sabotaged by a few bad actors. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also not true because they were prevented from asking questions. That's why they did it. Oh. Yeah. Somebody sent me a video of it. <laughs> How I it? still get information from it, there. And it, and it uh, yeah, it was just the thumbs down emoji covering this woman, you know, spewing <laughs> bullshit about what's happening at Vice. And yeah, there was there was no opportunity for these people who were recently laid off. And, you know, being laid off as this is happening, people were laid off, you know, a couple days ago um, to ask any questions. Like, what happened? What is this company becoming? You know, uh, am I getting a severance, which yeah, is the yeah. thing that, that none of them are getting. So that I thought was hilarious. That's yeah. amazing. They had their say one way or the other. <laughs> um, what's also going to get a thumbs down is Karine Jean-Pierre at the White House not refusing Using, or not giving us any information about President Biden's cognitive health or access to his doctor. So he's had his annual physical. It happened last year in February and this year again in, in February. And um, he apparently is fine, super robust. <laughs> his gait is a little stiff, but mm. no worse than last year. And when asked the money question, which is what about the cognitive yeah, test? Yeah. Here's what Karine Jean-Pierre said, sought for. 
Did the president take a mental fitness or a cognitive test during his physical this morning? You know, the president doesn't need a cognitive test. That is not my assessment. Uh, that is what? the assessment of the president's doctor. Uh, that is also the assessment of the neurologist, uh, who has also Bullshit. made that assessment as well. And I'll reiterate this. The president's doctor has said, if you look at what this president, he passes a cognitive test every day. Every day, no, as he no, moves no, from no, no. one topic to another topic, try understanding the granular level of these topics. Wow. He changes topics. Wow. He ch he changes this topics. guy. He changes quotes, even as he's trying to read them. <laughs> yeah. In that's the big amazing. type that is staff circled about Abe Lincoln. Yeah. It doesn't wow. cost anything to take a cognitive test. Just prove it. Though. Yeah. Okay, then why not? It's fine. Do it. He's doing all the other stuff. Well, he says he doesn't need one. Can't you tell, like, when I mean, you watch her, you can tell she's nervous, right? Like, she gets all, like, yeah, shaky. Yeah, the eyelids with nervous. all the sparkly shadows start to flutter <laughs> right. a little bit more. Like, she's like, oh, shit, we're on my weakest issue. <laughs> the president. Oh. Talking. Right, the, talking the president. Weak, weak the president. Talking about the president. Is well, then, then the press score, to its credit, because, you know, even the Democrats are not sure they want Biden now, so they, they're yeah. a little bit aggressive on the health now. Um, nothing like what they should be. But, you know, it's rare to see a little aggression by them. They, they're like, give us access to the doctor. Put him out here, which is not unheard of. Uh, yeah. And here's how she handled that. Why is, is uh, the president or uh, your office not willing to make Dr. O'Connor available to us? Why so, not? This so one? a couple of things, Andrew, and the president said that they thought he was too young. So, you know, you will uh, certainly <laughs> no, make funny. this robust, comprehensive memo, as we have done the last two years, available to all of you. <laughs> the doctor coming to, uh, coming to the briefing room, it is not a norm. We're trying to get back to the norm. I'll bet. Hmm. I want Trump's doctor out there, man. I, want that. <laughs> I love him. Just rocking that haircut. Yeah, that, like, Dr. Uh, Dr. Perfect. Dr. Dr. Vinny Boombots or whatever his name was. Um, like, it's easy to laugh, but it really is infuriating. Yeah. He, he needs a cognitive test. It's only the United States of America. It's the most important country in the world. Hmm. We deserve to know whether this guy can pass a cognitive test. It's pretty basic. We're so forgiving. We allow the 81-year-old man with all these problems to stay in the office, at least right now. Nobody's 25th Amendmented him. I verbed it. Um, <laughs> The least he can do is actually have a professional tell us whether he's okay upstairs. Do you want to know why they don't take the test besides the obvious one, um, which is that it'd be embarrassing, but it's specifically embarrassing. I sat with my father taking the neurological exam, doing the five words thing, um, and it was eye-opening. I've, I've watched my father father's sort of memory and and especially short-term memory and, and various things decline over the past five years. Um, and I'm not talking out of school and he's a sweet, uh, sweet man. Um, just turned 85. Uh, so he is, um, you know, he's president. younger than mm. Biden will be if he wins re-election <laughs> and serves it out to term. Um, and uh, they ask you a bunch of questions, including like, uh, what year is it? Mm. Right? Imagine getting that question wrong. My mm. father happened to say, uh, hey, it's, uh, it's April 1982. <laughs> yeah. Recently, and, this and is that's, recently. Okay. And that's eye-opening because <laughs> when you're hanging out with your dad and like talking about the angels or whatever, um, you don't necessarily get that level of, oh gosh, that's a big one. Like mm. 1982 is a lot different than 2024 or 2023 yeah. in, that, in that case. Um, there would be something like that. I mean, look at the uh, at the report that came out that they were really pissed off about uh, of the decision not to prosecute Biden. Mm -hmm. um, go into the granular details of why and what were the ways that he was bringing up his uh, son's death and getting the getting facts and years and times wrong. We've seen him do this for a long mm -hmm. time. Constantly. The and cognitive test too. will absolutely yeah. isolate that, and there will be a specific question about a date or a time or a place, and in theory, and I would suspect it probably would happen, he will give a crazy wrong answer. And that will show people immediately, like, game's over. It'll be the so end they're of his presidency. Do it. They'll it, never it, do and it. And, you know, it's funny, you said that about Bo Biden. And it, it's really interesting because the number of times he said that he died in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And people have said, well, you know, burn pits and maybe like a, like a second order death or something. And he never says that. He says he died in Iraq. And why would you ever say something like that when it's so transparently not true? You're the president. There's a press corps out there to fact check you, and it's easily checkable. I mean, everyone knows that this is wrong. And it gets checked. And it gets checked. Uh, you do that because you don't, maybe don't know. Maybe that is how you've uh, internalized it. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what it's become in your brain. And, and look, if you're out there in front of uh, the, the assembled press, as Karine Jean-Pierre is in this clip, 
in someone's asking about something, as you're supposed to do as a journalist, what is going on with, um, you know, what is America doing with uh, Julian Assange? Is he going to be extradited, et cetera? They're going to give you the runaround, and they're supposed to give you the runaround. These are secrets. These are things we haven't decided, et cetera. As a, a, a democratic nation, and you have, in an almost North Korean way, a woman putting herself between the press, the free press in America, and the president, if whether or not he is cognitively capable of doing the job, should be offensive to every American. Yeah. It should be offensive to every single American. It's not a partisan thing. I feel bad for the guy. I truly do. I don't. Yeah. I, I feel bad seeing an old guy who seems like he's confused. And more than anything, I. I'm offended by all the people that are plumping for him and saying everything's fine. He's faster than me. I oh, feel bad for us. No, I do feel bad I'm for us. I'm done feeling yeah. bad for him. I yeah. feel bad for yeah. us. Yeah. He, he and I am angry at Dr. Jill too. I would never let this happen to my husband, and my husband would never let this happen to me. Mm. If, if I start to lose it on the show, eventually Doug will give me the tap on the shoulder and say, "Honey, Provence, <laughs> it is. Let's go." Start. Yeah, star, star, <laughs> yeah. He did air He's quotes. been doing so many taps recently. He's like, "We gotta go. <laughs> Cut this off." This is absurd for her to allow this. I mean, mm. this. It, it really feels cruel, but it's mostly cruel to us because we actually have a lot of important things that Americans need help with or need the government to get out of. We need somebody sane to run the country, and we're not looking at it right now. However, he's apparently a very strong man. Just ask Howard Dean. Watch. Haley's hope has to be that she can present herself well as an alternative to Trump so that the convention can accept her should either Trump have a health problem, which he's certainly just as likely as a Biden to have, if not more. I mean, he's, I bet, I'll bet you anything that Joe Biden could beat the daylights out of Trump in a, in a push-up contest, for example. Oh and God. Trump oh. knows it too, although if it was a cheeseburger eating contest, it might turn out differently. Okay. He's looking pretty good, he's, yeah. Howard. Howard, you well, should, should we play that? Should we play that clip? I don't even know what to the say. The Howard clip? <laughs> Like, maybe we need to see it again. The screen? Yeah, the screen. Yeah, the screen. We kind of need to see it, don't we? Let's see it. That was an innocent time. Yeah. Do we have the screen clip? Of course. Oregon, Washington, and Michigan. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House. Yeah! Can you believe that ended a presidential career? Yes, I can. And yet. Yes. That was the worst scream I've ever heard. It went up like nine octaves. It's disqualifying. I mean, do you remember when, like, uh, making up stuff about your family and your personal academic career serially and, and plagiarizing another politician's life story Ooh. was enough to end a presidential yeah. campaign? I remember that too. Those are good times. That's yeah. right. Um, again, this. The American self-degradation just keeps going. But we're, the, the two people that we're choosing from have degraded themselves so badly so many times over the years. And we're just like, eh. I mean, that's why Dr. Jill is allowing this to happen, presumably, because she has told herself, like so many Democrats have told themselves, okay, sure, he might be in very obvious cognitive decline. And we're like trying to teach him how to walk so he doesn't trip every time. But, you know, we, he's the only one who could beat Trump, so we got to keep him out yeah. there. It's, you know, our sense of what the country needs and, and, and needs to protect itself from means that he has to be publicly humiliated because we don't have another. That's how people justify it. And the people voting for Trump against Biden or against Democrats are kind of doing the same thing. Like, yeah, sure, he's done all of these things mm -hmm. and he keeps doing them and he will keep doing them. But that's still better than, than you know, the, the elite, uh, you know, swamp out there. Mm -hmm. So I, don't you think the game with Biden is ju they just, these Democrats are like, we just have to get to November 6th. That's it. Well, technically January 21st. Mm -hmm. We just have to get there. And then as soon as he's in, like, we don't love Kamala, but at least we'll have a Democrat as president who we control. Like, we just, just get him over the finish line. He doesn't have to make it another four years. He just have to make it past inauguration so that we deny it to the evil orange man. It's not so long ago that Joe Biden and his team were making the formal decision to run for office again. And at that time, we all had pretty much the same body of evidence with respect to his obvious cognitive decline that we do now. And they made the choice mm -hmm. to push forward. And it's hard for me to believe that Biden was like meaningfully involved in that and mm -hmm. making a conscious decision just because he doesn't really seem capable of it most of the time. There are moments in there where it seems like he's just slept well enough and is just yeah, medicated no, enough to happens. actually perform that happens, in a yeah. moment. But it is a constant steady diet of these clips of the man just seem completely out of his depth in various contexts and everyone was aware of it. And I would have expected folks like AOC from the squad, for example, yeah. to draw a line in the sand Correct. early on yeah, and I'm say surprised. we need yeah. someone else to run here. 
but they chose politics. But, well, in a way, it shows you their power in the media versus their actual power within the Democratic Party, which is a lot smaller than they would like it to be. But, you know, with, with Biden, I mean, it, it, it's funny that we talked about this the other day. The argument is essentially the argument that Democrats made about John Fetterman. Yeah. Mm. It was like, it, it, there was somebody, and like, it might have been on MSNB, but somebody significant said, you know, the senator's not doing it anyway. It's his staff. Yeah. That's was literally an argument that was made. It's his staff. Don't worry. It can be anyone. We can put like a, like a paper doll up there, provided the people behind him are good. Mm -hmm. And that is essentially the argument now. And that's the one that they're running with. They're, it's no longer plausible. Like when you see Mike Barnacle. It's, oh it's like we're all out of humans in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> we have, we, I, we just, just outside. To make there's the so best. many. <laughs> and they're all better than the two <laughs> options we have now. Literally all of them. What did but, Mike yeah. Barnacle do? Well, no, he said the other day. MSNBC said, guy. What you do all the time is when somebody is so clearly not in the right sort of mental shape mm. is that you go so hard in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So Mike Barnum was on the other day. He says he, a 45-year-old, oh could God. not do what he does. Yeah. You should see and that is experience. And you see this constantly on TV. These people, and again. Green jump here. Nor, she says, I yes. can't keep up with him. Yeah. I can't keep up with him. In that all these meetings that we are not. Uh, running cameras on. Meetings. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, right. Just, Never seen any of them. Well, did you see yeah, the leak well. last week about his sex life? No. no. Yeah. I saw that. <laughs> no, no. I don't know if I yeah. want to. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we talked about it last week. I'm, uh, th there's a new book out that yeah. documents how he says they have sex all the time. These and are lies. It's getting, these are lies. <laughs> these are, <laughs> these are, but, these but, are obvious Camille, lies. but he thinks it's true. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> These are this lies. is with his girlfriend in Alaska, or <laughs> Canada, Canada. <laughs> yes. Wow. There's no accident that this drops now, and that he somehow gave this information to this reporter. I guess he's trying to make himself look more robust, right? Yeah. Getting yeah. some. That's going to change some. a few minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'll vote for him. One thing about the Dr. Jill, <laughs> what Camille was saying before that that strikes me. Um, uh, I'm sure Biden wants to run for president, just like I'm sure, sure. my dad would have loved to keep driving. Mm. Yes. The olds yeah. want to keep oh driving. God, they so should true. not drive. Yeah. They yeah. shouldn't. It's That's bad. exactly right. My mom, too. My mom I literally drove her car into the side of a building. She's like, I'm fine. I just, yeah. it's, everyone's, I'm like, a, did the other people live? Yeah. <laughs> that building wasn't there 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, my mom, she's got word search. Sometimes she can't remember the word. But yeah. she's in so much better shape than Joe Biden. Yeah. And like, th th it's terrifying to me that we're about to do this. Like, I don't think he's going to win. I don't, like, you've, have you seen the last round of swing state polls that just it's, came out? It's disastrous for him. Like, he hasn't been ahead in the swing state polling, no. like when you look at the six to eight of them, yeah. um, in months since November, at least, I mean, at the at the most recent, Trump's got all the momentum right now. I mean, you if you if you had a million dollars and you had to bet it on one, who who would you bet it on? I mean, it's an easy choice, and that's why the Pod Save America people, uh, a podcast I don't really understand, but it's the the Obama folks are now saying the exact same thing. Like we need to maybe call an audible here. What? They do. How? What? They, I, I don't, I don't know. But, but it, it, there is, there should be some contingency in order that y you're going to lose this election. Yeah, they're going and to lose. And if you think that the op, the, that if, if he loses, if the Democrats lose, on the other side of that is the end or the failure of democracy. If you actually believe that, which I don't think they actually believe, which is why they run and fund MAGA candidates against our friend Peter Meyer mm -hmm. in, in, in Michigan, et cetera. <laughs> These people hate to, you're, you're funding them. Why, why are you doing this? And this is the same thing here. If you actually believe that, you would be making a very aggressive rearguard action right now to get rid of him. However that happens, I don't know. Somebody could figure it out, and I, I, I'm sure. Mm. I still, I think I would bet uh, that Biden would win. Uh, if I had a million really? and I had to be forced to bet, um, I don't have any confidence in that. Why? Because uh, you, there's a consistent weird thing in the polls where the people who are otherwise being polled on the, on the presidency, um, high levels of independents and Democrats especially, but also some Republicans, don't believe that Trump is going to be the nominee. They still believe in the Chris Hayes fantasy that one of these things is going to yeah. wipe mm -hmm. them out. They haven't processed the news. When they process the news, that might look different. And also the exit polls, South Carolina was consistent on this, but the other ones before among Republicans, not just voters in the primary, but self-identified Republican voters in the primary, there's been a consistently high, um, at least the way they're t talking to pollsters right yeah. now, like, I'm not going to vote for Trump. You know, people who vote in the elections, granted, you know, they're in the process of voting for Nikki Haley. They have, let's say, different interpretations of January 6th than Trump voters tend to have. Um, but there is a never Trump, a measurable never Trump contingent among the Republican electorate, um, which says to me that uh, there is, I don't, I think the ceiling of Trump is 46%. That's what he got both times. Wait a minute, but 90% of the party came home. In 2016, he was more hated 
Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I agree with you. And also his uh, approval ratings within the party has always been around 90%. I haven't looked at, at that recently. But I, I think that there are, especially with the trials going on, um, I, th- I think that there is a larger never Trump rump among the Republican you do? party. I don't um, think so. And I, what about RFK, Jay? He's going to clear the vote. Well, that's yeah. the thing. That's, oh, but, that's yeah. another thing. But he t- RFK, um, I think, has... Uh, it's unclear how he affects the race. Mm-hmm. I think when you put a five-way poll, which is actually going to look more like what the actual ballots look like, right? Jill Stein's going to run for the Green Party nomination. They're going to be on 35 ballots, probably something around there. Libertarians will have, be on 40-something. RFK will be running. Cornell West might get some, too. Um, and when you put all of them in there, they do take from Biden. But a lot of that, I think, right now is uh, specifically Stein and West. Um, it's it, you would they, think- they love self-immolation, by the way. They love it. They do. <sighs> There, yeah, they, they really cheered that do. guy right on. You go, you yep. burn, burn, baby, burn. Um, Cornell West in particular, actually. Yeah, it was yeah. absolutely yeah. disgusting. Yeah. But but no, when you just put RFKJ in the mix, he takes from Biden. He, he takes hurts from both. Biden. He takes from both. But he hurts, I, I, I just looked at this on a, on a group of swing state polls where it was Trump, Biden, head to head. Trump was winning in all of them. Yeah. Then they factored in only RFKJ, and it was a bigger margin of victory for Trump. Right, Um but that's not what the ballots are going to look like. Uh, so, like, if you look at the, I, I think that the people who are saying that they're vote for RFKJ are actually going to vote for one of the left wing candidates to his left if they have the option to, mm-hmm. because they're pissed off about Israel, uh, because they're pissed off about whatever. So, some of that is him, and some of that is not him. I, I think in isolation. Um, he would give, he would take a, more from Biden, yes, but only a little more. I think there is a, a contingent among his crowd who, you know, they think that Trump uh, sold out to Pfizer. You know, there, he's got some like serious anti-vax people also. No like, more so than Biden. People, uh, people who want to break stuff against the wall, right? He's got, yeah. the, he's got that kind of energy a- attraction um, and some of that will take, will take from Trump. Well, let, me, let me ask you this. So I don't know, like RFKJ is going to be interesting and he's gotten the ballot on, I think, two of the swing states so far. So we'll see how many more. He, he's not a, a lock for all these ballots. Um, and, you know, we'll see. I don't know who's going to be on the ballot. It's one of the weird things. Like we're not sure how many of those five are actually going to make the ballots. Um, but I do think that the Democrats have a better get out the vote machine by far. And you heard Trump just the other day with Laura Ingram in that town hall on um, on Fox News mm-hmm. saying, don't mail-in val- ballot. Yeah. He's insane. Mm-hmm. Camille, you tell me how the Republicans are supposed to win an election without doing mail-in ballots, given, given the change. I know they don't like the change, mm-hmm. but the change has happened. And the, th- this is how the Democrats have been winning. Yeah. 20, 22 special elections, and now we're rolling into 2024. And you've got the party leader saying, don't do it. Yeah, I mean, I formally have bowed out of making any sort of election predictions since Donald Trump won the nomination. <laughs> yeah. the around. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's likely to happen. I will say that the, the RNC has been a complete shambles and Donald Trump's recent decision to help put one of his family members in a position of leadership there, I don't think that's necessarily going to help. It'll certainly mean that they're all playing the same game and singing from the same sheet music. Gonna help whether us or legal not defense operationally, fund. they'll be in a better position than the Democrats is not quite clear. This does seem like it's going to be another contempt election more than it is enthusiasm for Joe Biden. And in some respects, even enthusiasm for Trump. I mean, if I have to look at whether or not enthusiasm for Trump or contempt for Trump is likely to play a bigger role in the next election, it's hard for me to know which way that breaks. Mm -hmm. And it certainly seems like the contempt is really there and could be an animating factor that gets people to come out to the polls in a way that maybe another four years of Donald Trump aren't as interesting to someone who's MAGA inclined, but not particularly excited about the choice between these two particular men. If he, I, yeah, if he, stays quiet, yeah. if he stays quiet, he stays quiet over the next idea. year. Yeah. Yeah. I, but let, let me, let me, let me bring it into what happened in Michigan. So, um, Let's see. Trump won Michigan in the primary, 68%. Haley got 26.6%, uncommitted 3%. Biden won 81%. Uncommitted got 13.2%, which is 101,000 votes. Uh, he got 623,000 votes. And I've heard about 10,000 discussions. I got to be honest, none of which I find particularly interesting because it's just so early. I don't know like, like about what this means. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, Nikki Haley got 26%. There's That's 300,000 in Michigan who didn't want Trump. Does it mean that they mm-hmm. won't turn out for Trump? Trump only won Michigan by 11,000. Anything could happen. And then on the Biden, like that uncommitted 13% of the vote, it's angry leftists who don't like the Israel policy. Should he change the Israel policy? If, uh, whatever. 
Can we glean anything out of Michigan? Did you guys see anything they're of interest? They're often angry conservatives. They're angry Muslim conservatives in Dearborn. Mm. I, they're not leftists in any way. They're, mm-hmm. they're single issue they voters issue. on this. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's as significant as people thought it was going to be. I mean, a hundred, yeah, it's a lot of people. But I, I mean, this is the thing that people are using this, and you see this a lot in the media, on the left to try to move the administration. Mm. You understand you're going to lose the election. There's not a lot of evidence of this. But you, you lose the election unless you force Israel to do X or Y, which obviously also presumes that Israel doesn't make its own decisions, right. that America mm-hmm. does. There's something almost anti-Semitic about it. Like there's this <laughs> Jewish conspiracy in America that controls the Jews over there. Right. But the thing about <laughs> so Israel, the, the Haley stuff is take Haley out of it. She is like, it's irre- Haley is irrelevant. She is an irrelevance. But I'll say this, when we talk so frequently, less so now, but we used to talk frequently about the split in the Democratic Party amongst progressives. The squad was important, they were punching above their weight, younger generations, more progressive, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The conservative and the Republican version of that is those 300,000 votes, I don't see them as Haley votes, I see them as conservatives of the old school votes. Yep. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of those people like that- We still love that party. They, mm-hmm. they We're want voting, the we like Reagan that party. party yeah. And that's not the Trump party. They, a lot of them will hold their nose and vote for Trump. A lot of them won't vote. Some maybe even vote for RFK. And there's a contingent of people who will vote for RFK, by the way, because they are deeply low information voters. They don't know anything about him other than like, there's a Kennedy on the ticket. I object. We have on our ongoing battle over him. What? what? You, you, you he's misunderstood. That, no, I think that people will vote for a Kennedy. There's a certain amount well, of people who vote for a certain. Kennedy. But I think, I most, think, of the him, I think most of his fans like the fact that he's Yes, he's. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't like anti-vax, but that he definitely called BS on some of the lies that we were told about COVID vaccines very early on. That he's taken on the medical industrial complex. That he's taken on the intelligence and military industrial complex. He's extremely smart and well studied. I mean, like he's got ten thousand statistics on any subject for you, and he seems, I think, to a lot of people like a truth teller. I know you think mm-hmm. that's yeah. just an act, well, but no, I think, no, I mean, I think, I think he, he can talk about any yeah. issue yeah. in a way that neither Trump nor Biden can do. Never yeah. mind Cornell West and Jill Stein. No, he, he projects a kind of competence. And whether or not you agree with his perspective on vaccines, he will certainly level an argument and do it in a way that sounds very sophisticated and is rich with data that one will probably ignore and just say, yeah, no, he said it. There is a, a number in there. Mm-hmm. It must be true. Um, how many Americans will that persuade? Probably a meaningful mm-hmm. amount. Enough he, he's to a shake player. things up in a He's not going to win, but he's a player. But I, think, yeah. I think to Michael's yeah. point, um, you know, if you look at all of the polling of favorability ratings, uh, he's dominating the field uh, by, a lot, yeah. by yeah. a lot. And I believe that he's dominating the field because his name is Robert F. Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that he's dominating the field because people are like, well, yeah, I really uh, agree with uh, yeah. what he said about you know the, the vote in Ohio in 2004. Have or you looked to see whether he has mostly older support or younger support? I, I don't have a breakdown. Like I would only the older people would be like the Kennedys, yeah, like the younger true. people. And I think the younger people too, 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 but there's yeah. also a lot of the instinct because so much of voting is just a feeling, right? It's mm-hmm. a feeling you have about somebody. And there's so much of it that, that captures what Trump captures in 2016, he doesn't give a shit. He says middle finger to all the institutions. He'll take on all of them because he's a billionaire. This was the argument. A lot of people made this argument. Like, he doesn't care. He doesn't need them. He, he doesn't need the, the money from all of these big corporations. The version of that with Bobby Kennedy, as you pointed out, is like he takes on, you know, the medical industrial complex, Pfizer, the vax makers, everybody under the sun. The media. The media. And mm-hmm. he's gone hard and he just doesn't give a shit because he's a Kennedy. Mm-hmm. He has yeah. the money. He has. He's mar- married to the woman from Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. He's got a pretty good life and he's doing this. In a selfless way. He doesn't need this. Well, that's, that's the truth. Going, going I don't know how wealthy he is. I really don't know how wealthy he is. Hard, but yeah, but I, I do think he's truly committed to these causes. Like, that's the reason. 100%. It was, what, two years ago, he, he couldn't get on any any TV show, no. any mm-hmm. podcast. You know, we put him on, and we did an in-depth challenge of all of his assertions yeah. on the vaccine and all this stuff. It was a very interesting deep dive for me because we have no dog in that hunt. It was like, is mm-hmm. he a liar? Is he, is he full of shit on everything? Mm-hmm. And sure, there were some things when we kicked the tires, the tires fell off. But I'm telling you, on most of the things, the tires stayed on, and I was like, oh, I'm learning a lot. I didn't go full conspiratorial on everything <laughs> that he says. I know that's the knock on him. 
But the, the man actually has some real science to back it up. And then we called his critics mm -hmm. in the medical community, his critics. And we said, give us all the ammo. And we double checked those sources. And anyway, the net net of it was he is not as full of shit on this stuff as his critics believe. That was my independent takeaway. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing a Megan Kelly veep slot. It's an, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's an endorsement, too. Yeah. She's endorsed them. Yeah. Okay. Um, back to Michigan. That brings me to your friends, your friends on The View. They had an, an, a testy <laughs> argument over what happened on the oh. uncommitted, they're mad about the uncommitted votes, or at least some of them are. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't they getting behind Joe Biden? Why are these 100,000 defecting? Let's watch. You're in danger of seeming like a oh, one-issue voter. But to have a non-committed vote for me is, is hard because I know how hard people fought to get the right to have their voices heard. There are 300,000 uh, of the Arab population in Michigan. And, and Trump carried Michigan in 2016 by about 11,000 votes. They are telling you this issue matters. Hear us. Uh, the suffering in Gaza is first and foremost due to Hamas. But there is and suffering. There is yes. suffering. But my yes. point here is Biden heard everyone. And he gets it. The thing he's doing is not reverse electing himself by saying, what do you want? I'm going to go do that. Some of it is, I know what's right here, and I'm going to stand true to that even in an election and, year. And if he does not get Michigan because of this... <coughs> Then but those want, protesters is, will get wait, Trump. Then it is, and then it's not not a there are women that vote single issue. There yes. are evangelicals that vote single and issue. And we crutch at there, there are every African time. Americans that vote single single issue. So this is no different. Okay. <laughs> So that was actually kind of good. So it wasn't bad. <laughs> then they had the Sarah Haynes trying to do the more conservative take on it. But yeah. you tell me whether it's a wise move for Joe Biden to change his Israel policy because of what happened in Michigan. That is the most significant part of this. It's not like the harbinger, what's going to happen in the election, how important are these votes. What matters is the way that the Biden administration, I think it has been even before the vote and now afterwards, is internalizing that. They mm -hmm. are worried uh, stiff about young voters. If you look at a public opinion polls, attitudes towards Israel and Gaza and Mideast policy, it is... The 18 to 29 year olds are here and the entire rest of the country is over here yeah. in an opposite place. There's like mm -hmm. something like a half of that young electorate um, thinks like a fundamental problem is that Israel exists. I'm not, that's not an exaggeration. It's weird. It's like so strong. They primarily identify with the Palestinians as opposed to Israelis. Americans are not like that. We're the rest of them who are us who are not 18 to 29 don't tend to think that way. So because the youth vote has been so since Obama, so such a reliable turnout, for Democrats and so overwhelmingly Democratic, which it really wasn't until until Biden, uh, not Biden, uh, Obama. 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 I'm doing a Trump here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's normal. Yeah, so that's forget normal. a name here yeah. or there is human. Totally What's yeah. happening with our president is not. Anyway, yeah. keep going. So you can see the sort of flop sweat among the Biden administration in dealing with Israel policy right now. Like they really want a sped up timetable. Why? What's happening soon that you're really uh, worried about? Is it mm -hmm. the length of the war uh, and the humanitarian crisis? Yes, it is that. But there's also other things. There's an election, mm -hmm. and you are you can hear you worrying about that. Right now, the administration is being very insistent with Netanyahu, like we have to have a, a vision, a post-war vision of a two-state solution. Um, that is American politics. That is not Nothing the reality on the ground in yeah. Israel, uh, including among Palestinians uh, in Gaza or, amongst, or the West, amongst, in West Bank. Bank and Gaza. It's, yeah, there isn't it's dead. A, the two-state yeah. solution, there isn't. I mean, the it's people who are yeah. the most uh, in favor of the two-state solution in Israel will say that it's dead and they don't want a two-state solution right now. What Israelis want right now is to get the hostages back primarily, but also after they get the hostages back is to never feel that sense of insecurity ever again. Yeah. And how the state is formed as part of that question, okay, we'll get to that, but they don't have the sense of getting to that. The Biden administration, like in fairness, most American administrations of the past 30, 40 years, they, they just have two state solution printed on their brain plate and they're pushing it. I think one of the reasons why Biden is pushing it is he's worried about Michigan, he's worried about young voters, and he's worried about Arab Americans. Well, the, the odds of these people voting Trump are slim, exactly. He's not, but yeah. the, the odds of them staying home are real. I mean, well, by the way, just there. today, yeah. just today on my phone, I got one of those news alerts from ABC News saying 30,000 dead in Gaza per the Gaza Health Interior Health. Health. Minister, uh -huh. yeah. Ministry of Health. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. still citing them after yeah. humiliating themselves with that 
hospital bombing. Like, still, we've we've learned not to trust there this was, organization. There was a number of people now. that very tragically died today in a, a swarm of Gazan civilians on an aid convoy, and they were open fired on by IDF troops. So I was told, then I saw the Israelis pushing back on that. I don't know what's true. It very well could be that everyone who died there today was killed by the Israelis. They could have had a good reason for it. They could have had a bad reason for it. But to see the media again this morning, and I listened to it on NPR and various other sources, just going directly into it again. Yep. And while citing the Gaza Ministry of Health, which of course has no interest in uh, maximizing its casualties. Like, look, you know, Zelensky, and I'm unlike a lot of people that I think listen to our podcast, I'm a, a pretty strong supporter of the Ukrainians. And when they said 30,000, 33,000 dead, it's like, that's that's a fraction of what it is. I know he's lying too. Mm -hmm. I know the Russians are lying too. Mm -hmm. Everybody lies about this stuff. But I have had people tell me, academics, one very famous academic actually in this, said, I believe everything that they say. Rashid, what? Rashid Khalidi from Colombia. I believe that I know the people there. You don't know them. I know them personally. They wouldn't lie about this stuff. This How they is, get the hospital bombing so This wrong. is what, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. like this kind of stuff. And look, as this relates to the Democratic Party, I mean, it, it was, I don't remember what the exact number was. A pretty low turnout for Democrats in, uh, in Michigan. So that's also something to consider too. But if you're going to rest American foreign policy, an American foreign policy, which has been a very steady American for, foreign policy since 1948, on potentially losing this small segment of people in Virginia, you deserve to lose. You should not be, you know, trying to speed up a solution. You try to speed up a solution because you want those hostages to come out alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look, nobody wants any civilians there to die. I, I certainly hope they don't. In that, but the, the, the political calculations here and talking about them always feels very gross to me. And, and you know what mm -hmm. the worst is, you know, Joe Biden doesn't, he's on Team Israel. I really believe he yeah, is. He is. He he's just is. saying these latest things about like, oh, they've he gone is. too far yeah. to appease his staff, which is all these young, woke White House interns that releases a memo to the press every time they have some sort of sit in. Anonymous mm -hmm. memo. Right. Too, right? <laughs> so it's like, Brave people. Wear masks. Yeah. 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 They have some sort of effect. Yeah. And so I know you really want to talk about Chris Cuomo, and we're going to do that. <laughs> 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 we're going to do that next, right? We're going to take a quick break, are we? Yeah, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come right back with the guys from the fifth column. Don't go away. With cyber attacks on the rise, protecting your data security is more important than ever. So why is Congress considering a bill that could put your credit card data at greater risk of being hacked and exposed to foreign networks? Our advertiser, the Electronic Payments Coalition, says the Durbin Marshall credit card bill shifts billions in consumer spending to less secure payment networks, all so that corporate megastores can make bigger profits. Find out more about the issue at electronicpaymentscoalition.org and decide for yourself if you would like to tell your senators to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. Listen, it's leap day, which is exciting. Mm, yeah. We only get leap day every four years. And I had originally planned on taking this day off and having my kids take this day off and just to go do all the things that like we've never done. You know, like I've never taken my kids to the 9-11 museum. I mm. really would like to take my kids to the Just stuff that like you always say you're going to do, but then you don't do. Yeah. And then I realized, like, it's a school day for everybody. I have to work. There's a lot going on. My kids, this is like exam week at my older son. Like, you can't, right? Yeah. So... One idea that my hairstylist thought was maybe between now when I go watch my daughter and her play this evening, I could go skydiving. I don't think I'm sorry, that, what now? Is that, is that <laughs> that's going to happen. Okay. Does anyone have an idea on something we could do? Skydiving? That, well, I mean, I've never done huh. it. It's I, something I wouldn't normally do. Did she say, like, get a neck tattoo next or something? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, she said she did it and there was a Navy SEAL on her back and she really enjoyed that. Yeah, that mm. wasn't, she wasn't talking about skydiving. <laughs> um, <laughs> you just made that about skydiving. Sarah. Um, I don't know. Like, maybe you could, like, I think that after this, we're going to day drink. Yeah. Um, we'll probably just get some drinks during the day. Right, right I don't know street. if you've ever done that with your kids. <laughs> <laughs> Might be worth a try. I didn't, I didn't hear that the kids had to be involved. Yeah. So. Oh, is yeah. it just oh, yeah. you? Yeah, is well, it just you or the kids? Maybe just Doug could take him to the 9-11 Museum. Exactly. No, right. no, no. I, I'm, I think that, that we'd all be interested in visiting your masseuse, as yeah. described <laughs> earlier. <laughs> discussed earlier. Good Lord. It's a good day for that. <laughs> I don't even know um, what to do. I yeah. don't know. I, I, I've, I've been solo parenting for a week, and I'm, I have another one left, so I'm just thinking every day. 
day, what do I do? Yeah. I'm not very good at it. How old are your kids? I, I have one, and she just turned 13. Okay. And um, she talks with her friends in the back of the car going to school this morning like she's 25. Yes. And writes for national reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any of this. That's like, that's the secret conversation. They don't think I can hear. Like, yes. I'm an Uber driver who only speaks Georgian or something. And it's like, <laughs> how do they not know that I'm hearing all of this? Oh, my God. Doug and I were in the back of a car one time. And I... This is embarrassing for Doug, but it's, I'm going to tell it anyway. Poor Dugger. And uh, he he says he, he says it to me like he gives me a look, and I'm like, what, what? I didn't know what he was trying to signal. And he literally spelled out S E X. What? Sorry, huh? What? I'm like the driver, the driver can spell. <laughs> what are you saying? What he's what he was he trying? He was trying to get it on in a cab? No, he was oh. like making a plan for later. He's oh, letting me know. Is that, is that how you guys negotiate? <laughs> no, is no. Like, oh. He pushes the paperwork over. He's like, I'm thinking about 8.30 tonight. Do you consent? You can talk to your <laughs> yeah. I guess he thought Doug he communicated what he wanted to do when we got there with his eyes, but I didn't get it, and he felt the need to spell it. I mean, <laughs> she's a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the presumption is they don't this, know what that is. All right, so you don't have any greater leap day plans than I do. Um, but let's take a look. Let's check in with Chris Cuomo because yeah. I think yeah, yeah. we might find some sort of sure. inspirational thoughts Absolutely. from his podcast. Let's take a listen. What if I told you that I know mm-hmm. something that can absolutely change your perspective on your own life and greatly <laughs> increase your ability to deal with whatever comes your way? And here's a little inside tip. Everything that comes your way is the same. The art of acquiescence, as understood by Marcus Aurelius and taught by the great Stoics, okay? Okay. Whether it's Seneca or Epictetus, I mean, many great minds. I'm going to be haunted by what I did in the past. It's going to change everything. Uh It'll never be better. I can't fix it. I'll never get the job. She'll never stay with me. He doesn't really like me. (laughs) This isn't going to be what I needed it to be. I'm going to fail. All of those things, right? My kid's not going to get into school. They're not going to be smart. They're not going to be popular, right? Whatever it is. I'm fat. I'm never going to get in shape. Whatever it is, we get it. They all boil down to the same things. Kung Fu Panda said it brilliantly. It was actually Sifu. No, it was actually the turtle. Master... Uguay. Uguay. Master Uguay. Master Uguay. Oh, man. The past is history, the future, a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Genius. Yeah. Fucking loved it. <laughs> oh, okay. All wow. Right. I, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, America's shittiest guru. <laughs> Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Well, today he, was yesterday, <laughs> and yesterday is tomorrow. It's like, what is I, he talking about? I mean, I, the Kung Fu Panda bit, he yeah. lost me for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, for a second. But I, I like the mindfulness, like oh, the being God, in Camille. the present Camille. moment. Man, what are you? You should like, have that's never good. started smoking like, pot. This yeah, you are like no, Sam no, Harris. You, blame, you could blame Sam Harris. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is waking up. This is It's life affirming. Yeah, but he does He does a better job than Chris Cuomo, and he never mentions Kung Fu Panda. He doesn't make any sense. And, you know, by the way, it's an embarrassment to the Italian Americans, you know, because I have a little bit of that in me, and the Cuomo's are really just doing a bad job. This is not acceptable. But his, like, the thing, the list of things, which he's just a bad broadcaster, because it's like, I know you're in your house, but, like, there's people listening. Yeah. Why was the list so long? No, no it was one, all about his life. No one has and ever he's like, needed a I got no more. turkey, and I was trying to make a sandwich, for instance. And then Seneca said, I'm like, okay, fucking Wikipedia. Someone, someone just Googled this beforehand. I can swear, right? That's yes, right. Yes. I'm serious now. To be asking that one. Yeah, sorry. I'm yeah. fat. Yeah. Right? Third you one. just started the show. Yeah. Right? There was a lot in there. So God bless Chris Cuomo. I hope, hope it all works out. Um, you should get him on. You should ask him to come on. I. A date. Like him. Okay. A date. Stop I'm it hearing. right now. Um, <laughs> we've got to talk about Willy Wonka. Believe it or not, did you see? There's news about Willy Wonka. Mm-hmm. Um, a Willy Wonka inspired experience oh, over yes. in Glasgow, Scotland, turned out to be a scam. Mm. Yes. So apparently they were promised people were extraordinary props, oversized lollipops, and a paradise of sweet treats, mm. treats all promoted with dreamlike candy-colored images on the website. <laughs> when, quoting here from NBC News, when ticket holders arrived at the event over the weekend, they instead found a sparsely decorated warehouse with nothing resembling the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory franchise, the event invoked in its advertising. Look at the pictures it's of great. what they actually yeah. saw when they went to their 
Willy Wonka themed event. Stand by. Can you put it on the big screen so they can see it? They can, yeah. Only I can see it in the, in the camera. Oh, uh, I, it, can, I can defend this. It looks like prison. It, I can defend you this. Can no, defend, no, 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 you no. cannot. No. You cannot come, come with me no. and okay. you'll, at, you'll be in a world of pure imagination. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's exactly. exactly. You lose exactly. your imagination. Yeah. Uh-huh. Fill out Look the room. Look at this. Yeah. Oh and that's God. exciting. Oh. Wonka makes you joyful and hopeful. This makes you yeah. depressed. I mean, it's a prison suicide. But yeah. also, so does Glasgow. It's <laughs> 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 great. It was like that's a great Willy Wonka. Yes. He's going to be in there and like, that is what the, is that? Look, look at the website. This. What is that? They had to call the police because the, per- <laughs> the ticket holders were so pissed yeah. that it was a bait and switch. Look how Stabbing. depressing that's that is. Let me tell you something. Angry a Scottish little story people. for you guys. A story time for, with, with MK again. Okay. And uh, it was two, three, almost four years ago now. I it was 2020. We were during the COVID pandemic. We had just launched the show, and I was turning 50. And for my 50th birthday, my team booked Charlie Bucket and Veruca Salt, the real, the oh, wow. real, the real yeah, ones. Peter Ostrom and Julie Don Cole came on this show because they know I love Willy Wonka. Yeah. I yeah. love Charlie and Chocolate Factory. I love the book. I love the movie. I love it all. And it was the first and only interview in my life where I literally burst into tears before I asked a single question. Oh, I wow. I was so overwhelmed. It's a long story. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so Julie Donkold, Veruca Salt says to me, what are you doing for your 50th birthday? I'm like, oh, I can't travel. It's COVID. She was like, well, when you decide to travel, please come over here to London and we'll watch the movie together. Oh, it happened. Oh, wait, you did? That's I so did cool. it. I did oh it. Oh, my God. And I, I stayed at this beautiful hotel, which I highly recommend you. It's called the Brown Hotel. And look at this. They made a little Wonka room just w- through Abigail Finan, my assistant, and which was better than the one <laughs> in Glasgow. Yeah. This is just a hotel room that they put together wow. for, for wow. Julie Don Cole to come over. And we sat mm-hmm. there, she and I and my whole family, and we watched the movie together, and we sang together, and I'm gonna show you just a little clip. Oh my oh, lord. Here, watch. Oh, you, you what? 33 you times it took to get this scene don't done. Don't care how I want it now. Don't care how I want it now. Oh. Yeah, that's when I fell down. Bless the wine man. She and seems amazing just from that shot. She was yeah. awesome. She's amazing. Yeah. Ten, 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 she that's called so up an Oompa Loompa. We spoke to the head Oompa Loompa. That's, that's not what you the real Wonka uh, yeah. yeah. experience. Yeah. I'm sorry, but those poor people in Glasgow yeah. had no idea what they were saying. That's about. amazing. Oh, I've got a lot, so many follow up questions, but we don't have enough time on the yeah. Megyn Kelly show. But that's, wow, yeah. did you cry with her too while you guys were guzzling the? the, the it Mino? was a little. It was a little teary, but it was mostly joyful. Yeah. It was great because she... <laughs> did you she, pay her for this? Or did no, she, she can't. Okay. She, she offered. I took her up on it. I'm sure yeah. she wasn't thinking I was actually going to do it. I'm like, I'm here with my whole family. Can you please come over? She's like, sure. <laughs> She's so like, that mad American woman say, we go. No, sorry. <laughs> she was so nice. And I have to say, you know, she, like I, she's no spring chicken. And she... My son got COVID. This is still in the height of COVID yeah. mania, like I say. And um, it was early 21 or late 20 when we actually made, made it over there. And uh, I'm like, I had to tell her. I'm like, oh, my son has COVID. Do you mind? She's like, I don't care. She's like, no problem. She goes, just keep him on the other side of the room. We're good. She came. We mm. drank. We danced. We sang. That is amazing. It was a dream come true, you guys. Sometimes dreams really do come true. Um, but not if your name is Prince Harry. Oh. That's what we're ending it. <laughs> oh, my cast of favorites. Every time. Harry lost his big legal battle over in the UK to get them to pay for his security. He's pissed because when he left mm. the royal family, they were like, you left the royal family, goodbye. We're not paying for police coverage for you anymore. So he sued. And in his pleadings, where well, he just lost, but the judge released this in his decision saying, you're not getting this paid for. He said, I want the name of the person yes. who denied me the security. <laughs> Like, what's he going to do? What is Prince Harry going to do to this person? The entitlement and disgusting obsession with oneself and his fake security concerns. I'm sorry, but he just got paid $100 million from Netflix. He can afford he his can own hire, security. Hire security, dude. But it, yeah. yeah, and he said, I need to know the name of the guy who did this. And I thought that was just speculation. And I read the story, and it was actually in the ruling, which is crazy. And yeah, I kept on thinking, what is he going to do, bore him to death? Like, just sitting in front, like, <laughs> no, 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 my wife is not really a drag, you know? Like, I, don't, I don't know what he's going to do. But like, the security thing is... 
kind of bullshit in certain ways, right? The paparazzi's aggressive, and I understand that. But the narrative that you always get is that his mother was killed by the paparazzi. His mother was killed by a drunk driver. Drunk driver. And uh, Henri something or whatever, but he had double the legal limit and crashed with their paparazzi behind him? Yeah, but I think if he was sober, that wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. But that's been respun by everyone, like these horrible paparazzi, this is the life I have to lead. I'm getting paid $100 million by Netflix, despite having literally no talent and being a ginger. That's the second <laughs> part is not, it's just me. That's it's me. forgivable. <laughs> yeah, it's only my only thing. But it's like, you have a talentless family, and yet you're, and you're, the incredible thing is about somebody who just got the $100 million, or whatever it was from, from Netflix, to go to England, where you do not live, and say, and for a family that you've made a separation from and say the taxpayers of England should pay for this. Crazy, right. Yeah. The entitlement. Dude, and there is, no, there is no threat by, by pa paparazzi. They made up their fake car chase in New York, as you know. Even their Netflix special showed, they're like, oh, he's following us? It was one guy on a Vespa. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. You're going to get more when you leave Sirius yeah. XM. You three. Yeah. It's I, yes. sir. I think it was Matt Stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always doing yeah, You left your wallet. <laughs> he's following us. Get out now. They love me. Oh, idiots. God. You're pretty good with the impressions, yeah, buddy. I try my best. Yeah. Can you give us your Larry Flint that you gave us during the commercial break? No, oh my God, are you serious? Yes, dude, it's really <laughs> you, good. You have any idea how many organizations will write in and be like, <laughs> yeah, man, that little Larry Flint? Yeah, they just can't. It's, okay, no. but hey, what a weird impression to Larry Flint. I don't know. A dead pornographer. <laughs> okay, it's in your repertoire. <laughs> it's in my repertoire. It is. You guys, that yeah. was super fun. I, I feel like it's a standing now in person here at a series exam. Let's do it. In Love person it. and Absolutely. also every February 29th. Yes. Yeah, you're on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not until not. We will do it before that. Yeah. Okay, they're gonna go drink, and I might join them. Maybe yeah. that'll be my thing. Let me know what your thing is. Email me Megan at megankelly.com with your leap day plans. Would love to hear. Um, back tomorrow with two episodes. We're gonna do a live one uh, at noon, and then we're gonna come back after the closing arguments in the Fannie Willis case, with which I am obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> 